The neighborhood we know today as Pullman was one of the first industrial planned communities in the United States, explicitly built for the Pullman Palace Car Company employees. George Pullman set out to create a utopian society in Chicago. You see, he wanted the community to attract and retain the most talented workers available and hoped to do so by providing such a high standard of living that workers would be happy productive, and less likely to strike. Pullman is one of Chicago's 77 defined community areas and is a neighborhood located on the city's south side, 12 miles from the Chicago Loop. Situated adjacent to Lake Calumet, the Pullman District has many historic and architecturally significant buildings, some of which have seen better times. So join me as we discover the rise and fall of Chicago's Pullman District. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. hope that we never need life insurance, but mortgage payments, child care, and other expenses don't disappear when you're gone. So with the help of Policy Genius, this video sponsor, we can make sure you have your affairs in order. You see, Policy Genius was built to modernize the life insurance industry. Their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from top companies like AIG and Prudential in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $17 per month for $500,000 of coverage. Policy Genius has licensed agents who can help you find the options that offer coverage in as little as a week, and you'll avoid unnecessary medical exams. They're not incentivized to recommend one insurer over another, so you can trust their guidance. There are no added fees and your personal information is private. No wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net. You deserve a smarter way to buy it. So head to policygenius.com slash its history or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you can save. The model industrial town of Pullman, Illinois, saw its beginning on May the 26th, 1880. This town was the physical expression of an idea born and nurtured in the mind of George M. Pullman, president of Pullman's Palace Car Company. Although his primary manufacturing plant was in Detroit, Pullman was a longtime Chicago resident. His plan was ambitious. You see, by developing a total environment superior to that available to other working class areas, Pullman hoped to attract the most skilled workers to build his luxury rail cars and attain greater productivity due to his employees' better health and spirit. It was Pullman's philosophy that happy workers would make more productive workers. So he hired the best in architecture and landscaping to help him realize his vision. The 4,000 acre track selected for the factory and town lay in open prairie and marshland along the western shore of Lake Calumet, approximately 12 miles south of Chicago. The site was perfect as the town would have accessibility to the big city markets and railroad connections throughout the country. It was linked to Chicago and the southern states by the Illinois Central Railroad and then onto the world by Lake Calumet's connection to Lake Michigan and the St. Lawrence River. Even before Pullman's first residence settled there in 1881, visitors came to admire its beauty, which stood in stark contrast to other working class areas and industrial cities. Pullman employees executed the construction of the town. Structures were made of brick fashioned from clay found in Lake Calumet. A brickyard was built south of the town for this purpose. Furthermore, Pullman shops produced parts used throughout the building of the town. This project was perhaps one of the first applications of industrial technology and mass production in constructing a large-scale housing development. Amazingly, the town of more than 1,000 homes and public buildings was completed by 1884. Most Pullman employees lived in houses containing two to seven rooms. Foundations and some ornamentation were made of stone and pitched roofs were made of slate. 
the homes produced in blocks of two or more provided an economy of construction and maintenance. Each dwelling was supplied with gas and water, access to complete sanitary facilities, and abundant quantities of sunlight and fresh air. Every home had direct access to a private yard, woodshed, and paved alley. Front and backyards provided personal green space, while expansive parks and open lands provided larger, shaded ones. Maintenance of the residence was included in the rental price, as was daily garbage pickup. So Pullman workers lived in brick houses and had access to schools, parks, a library, theater, educational programs, and many other activities provided by the town. When the state labor commissioner visited in 1884, they proclaimed it was a successful venture, especially for the women and children who seemed protected from the worst aspects of industrial America. Pullman's architect was incredibly proud that he had met the workers' needs within the neighborhood and designs. Some even say that the distinctive row houses were comfortable by the standards of today. The concept of a company town like Pullman was not new or even unique. However, it can be argued that the execution of the idea in this case was perhaps the most successful in history. The total cost to build the Pullman town was $8 million. The first permanent residents, the Benson family, moved into the town on January the 1st, 1881 at Lawrence Street. By April, the Pullman car shops were in operation. By May, more than 350 people lived in Pullman. The original town of Pullman was completed in 1884 with an average rent for a three-room apartment costing about $8 per month. The rent for a five-room row house with a basement, bathroom and water faucet on every two floors was $18 per month. Larger homes for professionals and company officers began at $25. Rents were calculated to achieve a 6% return on the cost of housing. However, the investment never reached more than 4.5%. Housing in Pullman was somewhat more expensive than in other parts of the city, but it's important to note here that the housing quality was far superior to that available to workers elsewhere. All Pullman homes had indoor toilet facilities and running water, which was unheard of for the working class in the area of the city back then. By 1885, 30,000 trees bordered the streets and parks, primarily white elm, maple, ash, and linden. To supply enough landscaping materials for the entire community, six acres of land on the shore of Lake Calumet between 113th and 114th streets were used for a nursery and a greenhouse space. Various housing types can be found from block to block. The architectural differences were designed to meet varying incomes, status, and family makeup. But there was also a visual aspect as they suited variation in the general streetscape. Such variations are evident in the level of ornamentation in the roof lines, chimneys, and finished materials. Continuity was maintained by the similarity of proportions, repetition of crucial details and setbacks from the street. In many ways, the Pullman District was an amazing climax to an amazing success. You see, towards the end of the 1850s, George Pullman began remodeling passenger coach railroad cars. The Pullman Palace Car Corporation was incorporated in 1867. Its first manufacturing shops were in Detroit and New York State. By 1877, it operated about 460 luxury passenger cars, supervised by Caucasian conductors and African-American porters. By the early 1890s, nearly 6,000 of the company's 14,000 employees nationwide worked in Pullman, where annual output stood at 12,000 freight cars and 1,000 passenger cars. But as you've probably noticed by now, in our tales of urban decay, nothing lasts forever. After an economic downturn in 1893, the company laid off thousands of workers. Pullman employees responded in 1894 by going on strike. This strike soon had national effects because tens of thousands of American Railway Union members showed their support for Pullman workers by launching a boycott of trains pulling Pullman cars. So in response to a drop in orders for rail cars, the company lowered its workers' wages, but not the rents it charged those workers for the company housing. 
When a delegation of workers tried to meet with Pullman to present their grievances, he refused the meeting and ordered them fired. Ultimately, the board voted to strike and Pullman workers left the job on May the 11th, 1894. Then, by June the 27th, the American Railway Union joined the Pullman strikers in solidarity. The strike became one of American history's most significant labor actions, paralyzing most railroads west of Detroit and threatening the national economy. The strike ended violently by mid-July when President Cleveland intervened with federal troops. In 1898, the Illinois Supreme Court ordered the Pullman Company to sell all non-industrial land holdings in the town, but the company did not comply until 1907. Surprisingly, the company continued to grow despite its problems. By 1900, when the company changed its name to Pullman Company after acquiring the assets of its only real competitor, the main plant had nearly 6,000 employees and produced about $14 million worth of railroad cars per year. Ten years later, when the company completed this transition from wooden cars to steel cars, there were about 10,000 workers at the Pullman plant. Meanwhile, the company operated approximately 7,500 passenger cars, which at least complete with porters and other workers, to railroad companies worldwide. But the company was reorganized in the 1920s when the workforce peaked at about 20,000 people in Pullman. By 1927, a holding company called Pullman Incorporated was established to oversee the separate divisions. The Pullman Car and Manufacturing Corporation, the company's manufacturing division and the Pullman Company, which operated the world-famous passenger cars. Not all observers viewed Pullman from the same perspective. For example, in 1885, Richard T. Ely published an expose in Harper's Monthly charging that the town and its design were un-American. In his opinion, this condescending system took away men's rights as citizens, including the right to control their domestic environment. Remember, when Pullman workers went on strike in 1894, protesting cuts in wages while rents and dividends remained unchanged, the strike captured a national audience, so commentators from across the nation debated the true nature of relationship between employers and employees, and the broader question of political, social, and economic rights of the working class men and women. During the 1930s, Pullman Standard was the nation's largest manufacturer of freight cars and passenger cars. However, after World War II, the U.S. Department of Justice forced Pullman Incorporated to sell one of its two divisions. The operating company, which kept the Pullman Company name, was purchased by a group of railroad companies. Pullman Incorporated held Pullman Standard, which declined steadily throughout the 1970s. This is an important moment because it was in the 1970s that Pullman was no longer an essential manufacturer of rail cars. All the same, in 1977, Pullman Incorporated, still based in Chicago, had significant annual revenues and employed 32,000 people nationwide. In 1980, Pullman Incorporated was purchased by a New Hampshire-based conglomerate, and two years later, Pullman Car Works closed. Most of its rail car manufacturing assets and remaining freight car plants were sold to a Dallas-based Trinity Industries, but with the giant now gone, what would happen to its city? Pullman's avenues were originally named after inventors. The street names were to have changed in 1907, back when Chicago annexed Pullman. However, many of the old names were still used until the 1930s. For example, Corliss Avenue is named after the inventor of the Corliss engine, George Henry Corliss, as the Corliss steam engine originally powered the Pullman works and provided steam heat for the public buildings in the town. Dottie Avenue honors Dwayne Dottie, the original Pullman town manager. A street that no longer exists in North Pullman was Bessemer Avenue, named after Henry Bessemer, the inventor of a revolutionary steel-made method. His system is still in use today. Lastly, Cottage Grove has a long history. Charles Cleaver developed a suburb south of Chicago on the Illinois Central Line called Cleaverville in the 1850s. Cleaverville eventually became the Oakland neighborhood north and west of Hyde Park. 
Cleaver named the streets after a grove of shady trees surrounding his development cottage. The grove was a popular meeting spot for the early settlers. In subsequent years, the Pullman community experienced changes familiar to other neighborhoods in the city. Ethnic succession, the aging of housing stock, and changing employment opportunities that attracted residents away from the Pullman car works and into jobs elsewhere. Residents still perceived Pullman as an excellent place to live. Neighborhoods maintained strong ties with one another, especially the predominantly Italian and Polish ethnic communities and the neighborhoods themselves. Outsiders, however, only saw old housing and vacant industrial lands. Pullman's reputation fell dramatically in the late 1920s and 1930s when unemployment and bootlegging activities made it seem like a slum. By then, Chicago sociologists had expanded the Pullman community to include the largely unsettled areas between the old historic town and 95th Street. In 1960, consultants to the South End Chamber of Commerce recommended that Pullman be demolished between 111th and 115th to make way for industrial expansion. This move would have benefited the remainder of the Calumet region, but Pullman residents fought this destruction. You see, in the 1960s, they reactivated the Pullman Civic Organization to remove any signs of blight and to lobby to keep their neighborhood, realizing that the community's history could provide a very valuable wedge in the fight. And so they founded the historic Pullman Foundation in 1973. Pullman was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1971 and has received similar state and local designations. Pullman, the original showpiece community, retains much of its original architecture and attracts thousands of visitors each year. In 1994, North Pullman residents, essentially an African-American community, achieved city landmark status for the area of Pullman. At the same time, they established a museum honoring the Pullman Porters. Since then, the city has joined the two separate districts into one massive Chicago landmark area. Today, Pullman is a robust and historic community committed to preserving its heritage. The historic Pullman Foundation was formed in 1973 with a mission to expand the preservation efforts and seek more significant resources from the outside community. One interesting moment came in 1975 when the Hotel Florence and all of its original furniture and fixtures were in jeopardy of being sold at auction. The foundation took action and with the help of George Pullman's granddaughter was able to purchase the hotel and all of its contents. For the next 25 years, they worked to restore the building and keep it open to the public. The foundation also acquired several of the town's other architectural gems, Market Hall, and the historic Pullman Center. In 1991, the state of Illinois purchased the Hotel Florence and the Pullman Factory Clock Tower and the administration buildings in an effort to further develop the Pullman State Historical Site. The clock tower was eventually transferred to the National Park Services. Both sites have undergone extensive preservation and restoration work. Pullman is home to a vibrant community that's rich with history and renowned for its architecture. Architecture such as stunning row houses and restored company buildings. For anyone wishing to maybe go off the beaten path, Chicago's Pullman neighborhood is well worth the trip. It's only a shame that we can't make that trip in a regal Pullman carriage. Hit the subscribe button if you agree. And until next time, this is Ryan Sokash. Signing off.